questions. Please help me welcome Mr. Jim Tobin. Okay, so social media is a cocktail party, which proves one thing, that the title of my presentation and the title of my book are the same. I'm not very creative with titles. <laughs> I got one, and I'm just going to keep using it until people get sick of it. So how did we get here? Well, I don't know how you got here or, frankly, why you came, but um, I know how I got here. So as a traditional marketer, I was looking at things like blogging, and as someone who's over 40, when I heard about blogging years and years ago, I did what you're supposed to do. I made fun of it. Right? It's stupid. I mean, who cares what you think? Who cares what you write on your little blog? And nobody cares, right? We've got the New York Times, we've got big media, and that's what I did as a PR person. Right? Try and get in USA Today, try and get in the New York Times, try and get in the News and Observer, whatever the case may be. That was the cool stuff. This stuff is ridiculous. But over time, clients started to ask about, well, what about blogging? What about blogging? So I went to blogger.com, set up my little dumb blog, didn't tell anybody about it, started blogging every day about marketing trying to write something insightful, trying to write something interesting every day, which, by the way, is a lot of work. Um, and um, one day on a Friday, I got an email from a friend, and it was that Bud Light swear jar commercial. Have you seen this one, where everybody swears at work so they can put a quarter in the beer jar, and they're just swearing like crazy? And I thought, well, that's funny. I'm trying to be insightful, but it's a Friday, and I really don't have anything to say, so I'll just throw that on my blog. Well, pretty soon I looked back at my analytics over the weekend, and my traffic had gone up. 20, 30 full. And I couldn't understand it. So I looked and saw, well, the referring source is Google. The keyword is Bud Light Swear Jar. So I went to Google and I typed in Bud Light Swear Jar. My dumb little blog was ranked second. YouTube was third. <laughs> and I thought, there's something here. If I knew what I was doing, I could be dangerous. I mean, this is a powerful thing, right? So I got into a deep dive. I went crazy reading everything, reading the Clue Train Manifesto and Naked Conversations, these, these early books on the topic, and trying to figure out what to do with this knowledge that I was getting so excited about. And it took me months to figure out, like, who, who, who cares, right? Who cares that you're excited about blogging now? And who cares that you joined Facebook and friended the 23-year-old guy in your office who didn't friend you back and thought it was a little creepy <laughs> and is now in the center in the fourth row? And, you know, what are you going to do with that? And it was finally in church. It was in church one day. And I'm Catholic, so you have lots of time to be distracted. <laughs> and so I'm in church, and literally, boom, in my head, like a bolt of lightning, the phrase social media agency pops into my head. And I thought, whoa, this is like the literal definition of an epiphany. And as I come back to realize that I'm in church, I realize they're singing, Alleluia. Hallelujah, hallelujah at that moment. I'm like, whoa. And I laughed at my wife, who just walked in. Hi, Kevin. Um, she likes when I do that. Um, said, you know, I said on the way out, social media agency. And she said, oh, okay. And so we formed this company, and we got people who thought about marketing differently. And we got into the technology, and we got programmers, and we were thinking about Twitter, and we were thinking about Facebook, and all that stuff. And then... After a couple months of being in business, we didn't have any clients yet, let's not get ahead of ourselves, um, but after a couple months of being in business, we realized we were doing it backwards. That really, it's not about the technology, it's about how you talk. And over time, we started to write this book, and we realized it really did line up with this analogy, social media is a cocktail party, because we tried to beat this analogy to death for a year, and it, it kept coming back to life. It kept surviving our torturing of it. So with that, I'm going to share with you how social media changes things and how you do, despite whether you're 60 or whether you're 20, you already know how to do this stuff because you know something about the social graces. In fact, if you're 60, you may know a little better than a 20-year-old exactly how to do this because you know you're you know, a little more seasoned, right? So let's talk about that. What are the rules? But first, slide change. We're going to take a quick quiz. Okay, we're gonna take a quick quiz. Give yourself one point for each of these things. There's only 10, you don't have to take your shoes off. Okay, number one, you've created a Facebook profile. <coughs> number two, you've watched, just watched a YouTube video. Trying to get everyone on the board. Number three, you've created a blog, a little higher. Number four, you've used Twitter in the last 60 days. I know you haven't. You've ever created or posted to a wiki. You go. You've posted pictures to a photo sharing website like Flickr. 
You know what an RSS feed stands for. You've used an RSS feed reader to monitor your brand or your issue. You've submitted a story to Dig or Stumble Upon or Curtsy or Reddit or any of those. You've created or listened to a podcast. Maybe through listened in there. All right, who had five or less? Okay, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, you have to leave. <laughs> I got nothing for you. Okay. So that's interesting. It does two things. It tells me that there's a real split in this group between people who've done a lot of this and people who haven't done it at all. So hopefully, since this is not a technical thing, this should be fun. So what are the 11 cocktail party rules? Number one, you're invited. So here's what I hear from brands periodically. I was just talking to a large brand today who said, I'm trying to convince my boss to get involved in social media. And she said... I told him we already are. And that's the answer. It doesn't matter if you come to the party, the party's going on with or without you, right? If you look up NC State, there's plenty of people talking about NC State, whether NC State does anything or not. If you look up kryptonite locks, five of the top 10 results are about how easy it is to pick a kryptonite lock. That can't be good for business. <laughs> And this is an issue that came out in 2004. So if this happened to Sun Microsystems today, who's very involved in social media, none of this would make the front page. Because they've got 90,000 blog posts written by 4,000 bloggers in their company on 4,500 different blogs. You can't get on the home page. So the cocktail party's going on. There's thousands of these little conversations talking about your brand or your issue. Doesn't matter whether you're playing. They can say, you're wonderful or you're terrible, whether you're there or not. Number two, if you go to a cocktail party, you don't walk in and say, hey, I'm Jim, you need a social media agency? You don't do that, right? You listen first, you figure out what the conversation's all about. That's what that RSS feed thing is. So RSS, all it means is really simple syndication. You don't have to go check all these websites to see if they have any new content. You set up a feed, all the content changes come into your feed reader. So if there's 10 sites you regularly check, anytime they have new content, it'll show up in your Google Reader, right? But more than that, you can do issues. So if you type on any website, try this, because it'll help me. Um, you type Jim Tobin and marketing on any website that you have, except like a private Facebook page, and I'll know about it. Because I've got that in my feed reader, and I check it because I'm a narcissist. Um, if you type Ignite Social Media as a phrase, I'll know that too. So you can, it doesn't matter if I follow that blog. You can set up things that you're interested in, and they come into your reader. Now let's say you're the World Bank and a zillion people mention the World Bank, and one's an eighth grader writing an essay, and one is somebody you really should deal with, there are much more sophisticated tools like Buzz Monitor, Buzz Logic, Radiant 6 that separate filter from noise. Important blogger said you are terrible. Eight-year-old said they're writing a paper. So the first part of social media, even if you're not going to do anything, is to listen. Same thing you would do at a cocktail party. Act naturally. This is so hard for brands because brands have been conditioned for years to do things in a weird way, right? There's a thousand things we can say about our brand. Let's filter it down to the three very best ones. Let's polish them up in this neat little commercial. Everything's hunky-dory. Step forward, put our best face forward. You don't have to do that anymore. Number one, I'm not sure it's going to work anymore. But number two, you don't have to say, we've got the smartest people at Ignite Social Media anymore, right? Because nobody believed you in the first place. What you can do now with things like Ustream, I mean, we can connect that camera to a laptop and we can stream this thing live for free. And people could decide whether you're smart or not. And them deciding you're smart is infinitely more powerful than you telling them they're smart. So if you can talk to people and you can just share your expertise and you can be yourself, people will gravitate towards you. Same kind of thing at a cocktail party. That guy's really interesting. More people are talking to you. Yes. Flip side, if you're a moron, you may want to skip this strategy. <laughs> Number two, different places, different faces. So you're invited to a cocktail party at your boss's country club, overlooking the 18th green. You're invited to have beers with your buddy on his patio. Different things, right? You're going to speak differently. You're going to dress differently. LinkedIn, I got a little tie on. Facebook, don't have a tie on. 
And so the point of this is not really what profile picture you use. It's that you need to understand that each social network or each you know, little piece of functionality that we're talking about here has its own rules, has its own decorum, has things you do and don't do. And if you can get in those communities and listen first, you'll understand those rules in the community and you won't make the mistakes that get you called out. It's not all about you. So you can talk all about yourself at a cocktail party, and I know some people who do. Um, it doesn't really gain them any points. So sharing stuff with others. So one of our clients is Nature Made. They make vitamins, right? Our job is to get people excited and talking about what our clients want them to talk about. It's somewhat challenging to get people to talk about vitamins, right? You take them, you feel good, that's good but it's hard to get them excited about it. So what we were doing is sharing information on healthy living, sharing information that others wrote, sharing information about other brands and products and things like that to be really, it was more about a healthy lifestyle. So in, with that respect, lots and lots of people following Nature Made, friending Nature Made, all those sorts of good things happening because we're not just talking about ourselves. Fake doesn't smell good. Lots of the early mistakes made were made here. So Walmart said, hey, there's working families for Walmart, and they're supporting this couple who's driving from Walmart to Walmart and camping in their RV in the parking lot just because they like Walmart so much. I don't even want to go to the Walmart a block from my house. I mean, does that make any sense? Would anybody camp at every Walmart in America? Would they really Walmart across America? In that, the wisdom of crowds. There's a lot of people reading stuff online, and that didn't smell right. And within about 10 minutes, they realized it was the PR firm Edelman that was behind that. The CEO of Whole Foods was tweeting about his competition with a, with a nickname, saying how I hear their, their numbers aren't so good, all that sort of stuff. That came out. So what a lot of people do when they get into social media is they do these campaigns, because we've been conditioned to do campaigns, and let's, let's create a character or something like that. That stuff doesn't work. People figure it out too quickly. Play nice and share. This is interesting. People, it's called the momentum effect. People like to share with others. They like the feeling it gives them to pass on something that they discover and they like the feeling of helping others just because they help them. And it's very strange. You've got lots of people in lots of forums just doing this for no good reason, just adding how to, you know, what they think about whether you should provide Linux drivers with Dell hardware or not. Lots of people weighing in on that stuff for no good reason. Wikipedia, I mean, if we had said five years ago, we're gonna have an encyclopedia and people are just gonna edit it out of the goodness of their soul. That wouldn't sound like a good business model. But in social media, people actually, this helps. People do want to be part of a community and feel like they're contributing. But the context in which to do this is key. So Seth Godin, who many social media people pray to, um, he said, the web is the single worst medium ever invented for interrupting people. And if you think about pretty much every kind of marketing out there, a TV ad is an interruption, direct mail is an interruption, Radio ads are an interruption. Uh, e email is an interruption, right? You're supposed to stop somebody from what they're doing and say, pay attention to our Cuisinart or whatever you're trying to do. It's very hard to do that on the web. We're doing the exact opposite thing. If you look for, I can't make you want a social media agency. I can't make you think about it. But as soon as you think, maybe we should get one of those, you'll find us. That's what this does, right? We've got a thousand little pieces of bait floating out there working together to help you find things. So when somebody's looking for something, make sure you're there to help them. And that's what the context is. You can't just blast this at everybody. You can't broadcast it out. And build a friend base. I had a company call me. They were in the middle of a national crisis. It was big, big, big news. You all heard about it. And they were getting killed in the blogosphere. They were being called communists. They were being called all these terrible names. That, yeah, communists, that's a good one. Um, and they said, what can you do? What can you do for me? I said, well, do you have, do you have a blog? Do you have a network of people online that you can tap? Do you have this? Do you have that? No, 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 no. And they knew that the, this thing was going to blow over and be resolved in four or five days. 
I said, well, you're just out of luck. There's just nothing I can do for you. Good luck, hang in there. And they called back a couple weeks later and became a client because just like you can't walk up to somebody at a cocktail party and say, I'm Jim, will you watch my kids this weekend? <laughs> you can't say, I'm Jim, will you help me shield this product? So what you've got to do is build your friend base before you need it. And then you can ask for help. The way I sold the book is just mercilessly shilling to my friends, right? That I've got this book out and I'm trying to sell it on one day to get on the Amazon best bestseller list and if you're remotely interested, will you buy it? I could do that because I had never asked for anything before and I had built my friend base before and as soon as it was over, I went back to sharing things that were valuable, I hope. So that's an important thing. And then this is wildly challenging. Be interesting. It's so hard to be interesting. How can you get a campaign that people will pass along for me? Well, find something to talk about. We'll talk about Will It Blend in a, in a few minutes, but you've probably seen the Dove Evolution campaign where this woman is made up and then they distort her face on the computer and all that stuff. Brilliant, brilliant stuff that Dove did. And it's, it's related at least somewhat to their product line, which is beauty supplies, in a really interesting way. That's what gets shared. And it's so hard for companies that have been conditioned to be safe to be interesting. But the person at the party who's telling the interesting stories is the person everybody remembers and the story they tell when they get home. Same kind of thing. Lastly, don't drink too much. Just, it's never good. And the online version of this is kind of sort of drunk tweeting. So there's a couple stories here. This guy, Key Influencer, is his Twitter name, and he's a Ketchum PR executive. And he, his client is FedEx. He flew to Memphis to meet with them, and he tweeted, true confession, but I'm in a city where if I had to live here, I would kill myself. Well, the FedEx person follows him, took umbrage to it, wrote back to him, CC'd all the Ketchum executives and all the FedEx executives, and said, if I understand your post correctly, these are comments about Memphis a few hours ago. Onward, can I remind you that we're one of your most lucrative clients? Can I remind you that we all took 5% pay cuts to continue to live in this fine city and we don't appreciate this kind of stuff? This is all public now. A guy yesterday tweeted that he got a job with Cisco. And he tweeted, I have to make a decision now. Just got a job offer at Cisco. Do I choose between the fatty paycheck or the job I'll hate? Somebody at Cisco saw it, wrote him back, and said, what area of Cisco? Because I'm pretty sure we don't want to hire people who will hate their jobs. He pretty quickly deleted the tweet. He made his, his Twitter page private. Didn't matter. There's a YouTube video where he's portrayed as Hitler. There's all sorts of parodies. You just, if you're, just Google Cisco fatty, and you'll find all sorts of stuff about his fatty paycheck comment. Hannah Montana CD is someone on Twitter. She, I assume, because it's you know, either Hannah or Miley, um, <laughs> is Twittering all sorts of stuff about Hannah Montana products. She has sent, this is 4,459 updates. So she's tweeted almost 5,000 times. It's actually over 6,000 now. Only 44 people follow her. <laughs> it's really easy to be ignored. So she's wasting her time doing this because she's not interesting. So lampshade on your head, not a good idea. So those are the rules of social media in terms of the cocktail party, but let's talk about why you would want to do this stuff now that you can lose a job over it and all these other cautionary tales. Well, real-time communication. So Flickr, photo sharing website, changed their homepage a couple months ago. And immediately the Twitterverse, the Twitterati, lit up with hate what Flickr did, hate what Flickr did. There was all sorts of updates. There were blog posts about how terrible Flickr was for making this change. But within a couple of hours, they put it back. And they said, sorry, honestly thought it was a good idea. <laughs> Clearly you don't like it, it's back to normal. That kind of thing would typically take weeks or months or focus groups or letters or all that sort of stuff instant now. When we were with Nature Made, they just launched this big campaign. They were giving away a half million samples. We were out doing all these things, and we found these conversations saying, it's a good giveaway, but hang in there. The site takes a long time to load. We went to the site at Loader right away, but we had, we had it cached, which means it was already sort of on our system. So when we cleared our cache, it took 
two minutes and 45 seconds for the home page to load. Nature Made didn't know it, we didn't know it. We found out in the blogosphere, we called them within, an, it was actually pretty complicated, within a couple hours they fixed it. They would have lost, they were spending millions on TV, they would have lost all that web traffic, but people in the blogosphere were chattering about it. So if you're listening, you're getting real-time feedback that you used to have to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for or not get at all. Crisis communication, a, a guy named Bob Garfield who writes for Ad Agents, Ad Age, started a website called ComcastMustDie.com. It's a bit of a problem if you're Comcast. And just for the record, it's not anything we worked on. Um, I suppose that's good. Um, and they were, they were just listing in the comments, hundreds and hundreds of people were listing their problems with Comcast and why they hated Comcast. Comcast did a very smart thing. They went on the blog, they started monitoring it, they started leaving comments back, they started contacting people who left the comments saying, I'm with Comcast, let me fix this for you. And pretty soon people were saying, wait a second, Comcast is fixing this stuff. And on the site, Comcast must die, it says leave a comment, don't forget to include your account number, but no other personal information. Comcast has been extremely good at following these complaints. So what we found is when there's a crisis, and you just respond in a human way saying, oh, let me, let me try and fix this. We're here listening. The vitriol goes way down. So it's a, it's a handy for crisis communication. It provides, this is important, it provides the human experience. So it, it, one of our clients is Microsoft. Other big companies like Dell or Walmart. Or, take any big brand, right? It's easy to hate a big brand. Right? It's easy for me to make a joke about not wanting to go over to Walmart, right? But it's very hard to not like Richard at Dow if he's emailing you or Twittering you or communicating with you. It's much harder to dislike people who you know are doing their best at a company rather than a faceless monolith. So Dell has done an excellent job with this. You got about a team of nine people or so who are reaching out all the time. If you say something about your Dell laptop being broken, they come back and say, can I help you with that? They're sharing things. They have Dell Outlet on Twitter where they sell, you know, I've got 25, 22-inch monitors and they're refurbished at a great price. You want them, you know, here's the, here's the coupon code. They've sold a million dollars worth of product that way. So it can, it can work, but the human experience is important. Um, actually, I thought I'd added a slide, but I'm not. I, I um, was with the, the guy from Dell who's the director of this program, and he said, how do we do this? 10% technology, 90% people. So it's easy to get focused on the technology, but really this is about being a person, being a human being, which means empowering the people who work for you to, to act that way. Reputation management, we touched on a little bit, but if you look up Steve Jobs, Apple's bio on Steve Jobs is not first. Wikipedia is first. And if you look down about fifth, the diary of fake Steve Jobs is there. So some guy who has a blog, pretty famous blog actually, called Fake Steve Jobs is now competing. So this is a reputation management play. I talked to the people at HP the other day, and this is a neat little story I learned from them. Xerox came out with something called Solid Ink. They thought that was a big innovation. They're going to steal market share from HP. HP, I'm sure, among other things, but one of the things they did right away was write a blog post pretty much the day of the announcement, the day after the announcement. Xerox Solid Ink, reality versus hype on the HP blog, and it still ranks fourth for solid ink printer. So as soon as you go look for a solid ink printer, there's the other side saying, wait a sec, you may not want one of those. And it's because they already had the blog in place, they already had the Google juice. Blog is an acronym for better listing on Google. <laughs> it's actually not, but it sounds really good. Low cost reach, okay, so will it blend? How many people have seen a will it blend video? Okay, so you've got a blender company and your challenge is to be interesting. Really tough. Genius idea, they started blending things like iPhones, Guitar Hero, rakes, handle first. <laughs> and they're getting four, five, six million views of this stuff. It cost them $50 to make the first one. Golf balls, glow sticks, uh, Barbie, and it blended everything but the head. It was creepy. <laughs> and. And so, I mean, this is brilliant. Even if you don't want a blender, you've got to come out watching one of those things going, I need that. I've got to have one of those. My, my blender just stirs the bottom. These are $399 blenders. 
and uh, I, we need one, honey. <laughs> we talked about search engine optimization, but this is what, uh, again, that funnel thing. So this is, this is something, this is sort of a representation of what's called the long tail. It's a, it's a geek term for those of you who are science, very familiar with it, but your top 10 keywords are gonna drive maybe 20, 30, 40% of the traffic to your site, depending on how rich your site is, right? So you're gonna try and optimize for those. We're gonna fight to win Ignite Social Media. We're gonna fight to win Social Media Agency, right? But that means, in this chart, 75% of our traffic is coming from the long tail. These little keywords that are sending five and 10 visitors a day instead of 50 or 100 visitors a day, right? So what this allows you to do, instead of that funnel that we talked about, let's take the thousand things we can talk about, narrow it down to our three talking points and make it commercial. Let's write a thousand blog posts on each of those thousand things we could talk about. And now whoever looks for any of those thousand things can find us and be pulled in. And if you build a site with 100 pages on Google, launch it tomorrow, I build a blog and make 100 blog posts over 100 days, I will outrank you wildly. Google likes regularly updated content and will reward you for it. So this is a huge, what we do is a huge search engine optimization play. Who's doing it well? Who's doing it badly? A couple of examples. Here's a, here's a fail example. And Allstate, I don't know if they're gonna be watching the video, sorry, but this is just not very good. Um, they decided that they would set up community forums where you could talk, listen, talk, and share. This is a place for you to share what's on your mind, whether it's, uh, it's for seniors or empty nesters or people just graduating, share what's on your mind at allstate.com. <laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> and it turns out nobody else does. We've been to this site several times, and Allstate gets a lot of traffic. In these forums, it says there are currently four guests online on the forums. That's the highest we ever saw, and we were one of the four. <laughs> we saw two a lot, so we saw three a lot, but they got to four, so we gave them credit for it. Part of the problem is they're writing posts that are irrelevant to Allstate. So here's the moderator, she works for Allstate. How's your fantasy football team doing? You know, it's funny you should ask because I was just about to call my agent and discuss that with him or her. What is your favorite gospel song of all time? Well, I don't know. Um, so there's what they're trying to get people to talk about at allstate.com. There's no point to that. There's a little thing called Facebook that's probably closer to succeeding than this. When they do get things, here's one, can anyone at Allstate help me, a customer of 17 years? Somebody made that post. They didn't respond. Mm. Can somebody help me? Other people were in there responding saying, try this, this is what worked for me. <laughs> Call the CEO's office was one of the tips in here. <laughs> so here you see, um, this is Marsha, she's the, um, moderator who works for Allstate, Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Um, how do you escape the winter blahs for responses? What do you do to celebrate Black History Month? No responses. High insurance rates started by somebody else, 12 responses. So the community's trying desperately to tell Marsha what they want to talk about, <laughs> and Marsha's up checking her gospel collection. <laughs> So what do you do if you're Allstate number one? Listen to the consumer, okay? This is just bits and bytes, change it. Okay, and I was on there the other day, they're starting to look like they've seen what's going on. Number two, you've got this great campaign with the president from 24, Dennis something, on there, and you know, that's Allstate stand, right? It, those are good, those are pretty good commercials for an insurance company. Nothing online relevant to that. Nothing in these forums relevant to Allstate stand and then talk about topics that are on brand. I'm very interested in insurance, financial things, when I'm buying a house, when I'm having a baby, when I'm getting ready to retire, when I'm entering the workforce, thinking about 401k, whatever, that's when Allstate might have a chance. Who's doing it well? Well, that, shocking, this is one of the things we did. Um, there are many others, but I, you know, I know this one better. So, our client is Fathom Events. They're part of National Cinemedia. They put on events in movie theaters, special events like the, the Metropolitan Opera. You can see it live in 450 theaters across the country and in the surround sound and all that sort of cool stuff. So they're showing a documentary called A Powerful Noise, which is about empowering women, 
in Africa to raise up communities, those kind of things. Their goal was to get people to come to this documentary. They partnered with CARE, the charity that did CARE packages, won the big charity, lots of, I think Bono was part of. So lots of good altruistic things here. And we thought, well, neat, it's called a powerful noise. What's social media if not noise? All right, so let's try and harness this for, for good. So we did a couple things. Number one, we built a visual petition widget, and I'll show you what that is in a second. But what you could do in this widget is you could upload your photo as part of a petition that you were supporting women's rights, you were supporting empowering women. When you uploaded the photo, it, behind the scenes, without you knowing about it, went to a Flickr group. Every four hours, the mosaic pulled all the pictures from the Flickr group and redrew itself. And as more people uploaded the pictures, the mosaic got noisier and noisier. So we were making a powerful noise. And then you could take that little piece of functionality where you uploaded your picture and you could put it on your Facebook page, your MySpace page, your blog, your desktop, anywhere you wanted to with a click of a button. And that's basically what a widget is. In three weeks, 541 people installed it on their websites. So now we started with one website. We were up to 541 in three weeks. So these people basically marketing this movie for us because in the, in the widget you could watch the trailer too, all that sort of stuff. So. 500 people signed the petition, and everyone was talking about a powerful noise. If you look, Google the powerful noise, you found this. We, this. This is the widget. I don't know if you can see it, but so it's got this functionality, and then it says get and share at the bottom, and you can grab it and put it on your website. We also did something called a Tweetathon. This is the first ever sponsored Tweetathon. So if you ended your tweet with the phrase hashtag pound sign, a powerful noise, every time you did it, we donate a dollar to care. So all you had to do was include it. It didn't matter what the rest of the tweet said. If it had a powerful noise at the end, it would, it would uh, get you a dollar to this charity. We had 2,100 tweets in four days. A powerful noise was the second most uh, powerful or high, hottest topic on Twitter that day. It was 3-3. It was March 3rd, 09. We couldn't beat Happy Square Root Day. <laughs> We are dealing with a geek community, uh, but we came close, and some top Twitterers with 50,000 followers were sending this around, and, and movie theaters were selling out, and they were adding additional theaters, which was the goal. And even, this is MSN.com's homepage, where they put the hottest search topics. Number one hottest search topic of the day was a powerful noise. So we were getting people to figure out, what, what, what's everybody doing? And they were, a, a certain number of them were coming to see the, the event. So what's gonna happen in 2009? I'll fly through this real quickly. Viral videos, that's what everybody, you know, hey, isn't that what you do, do you make viral videos? Well, first of all, very few people make viral videos that are any good. Gatorade has this one that you've probably seen. Um, I'll just let it run in the background, but it's the, where the ball girl is involved. This has 1.6 million views. It's really hard to do this. It's really hard to do a video that's interesting and on brand. So the ball girl makes the catch, and at the end, she goes down and she sits down next to a, a Gatorade bottle on the ground. It's about a one-second shot. That's the only sign that this is a Gatorade commercial at all. Really hard for most brands to do that. <laughs> right? So this is great stuff. That's, that's it. That's it. This is really, really hard to manufacture. It's lightning in a bottle. It's great if it works, but I wouldn't invest a lot of money in it. What you're more likely to see is Coke releasing Mean Joe Green, making it a commercial and getting 187 views. All right, I don't think they ever thought it was gonna be 1.6 million, but why'd they edit it together if only 187 people were gonna watch it? So it's really, there's tons of viral videos that are sitting there not viral because you don't decide viral, people decide viral, right? So what I think is gonna happen is people are gonna be less focused on getting that 20 million view thing and more focused on, we got 100,000 computer engineers or we got 100,000 X. Those are the people who really have to see this stuff. And if we can do that, if we can get a little infection instead of an outbreak, we're gonna be very successful. Content aggregation, there's so much stuff out there. If you can pull it together, you can add brand value. This is a site we built for Intel that pulled together all the noise around the Consumer Electronics Show in January in Vegas. There's a ton of tweets and blogs and YouTube videos and Flickr going on and we just pulled it into one place. That adds a lot of value to Intel. I think it can go a step further if you did human filtering, if you pick the best posts. So replacing sort of the newspapers, I think that's gonna happen more and more. Mobile social, 
phones are going to change all of this. I just saw, I don't think it's up here, nope. I just saw that 75% of all electronic messages sent in the world are sent from a phone. Nine out of 10 of them in emerging countries <coughs> are sent from a phone. So people are doing, uploading photos from phones, product reviews from phones. Somebody is gonna get it right on the phone. There's Bright Kite, there's some others. Nobody has it quite right yet on the phone, but when they do, it could trounce Facebook, it could trounce MySpace. The return of people. So customers are spending 50 million, 100 million, 300 million, 500 million on advertising campaigns, and they've cut their staff back to appease stockholders. If you're gonna do this stuff, it takes some people. So you're gonna see some investment in social media jobs around, uh, around in different companies. You're already seeing that, but it's just, it's, it takes people, whether it's agencies or, or company people. And you're gonna see fewer shiny tools. Last year I got an update like every week on there's a new tool. Right? It, was, it was all these Twitter clones for a while, and, and now Pounce was the hot thing, which I never understood. That's gone away. Pondango was a hot thing. That's gone away. We're going to see less of that. We're going to see more tools like TweetDeck and others that help you manage all this noise. We're really social media 1.0 right now. We're, we're over here on Facebook, over here on Twitter, over here on this. It's got to be all pulled together. So I think less of that, more utility coming. And with that, we've got some time question now that I threw all that at you. So, it's a cocktail party. I'll pass you the glass.